Hello Internet, and welcome back to more Pokémon Generation 1, and more specifically to the beginning of Pokémon Stadium. This game is weird. It's a weird mix of a battle simulator and emulator for the first generation of games, and some relatively simple battle facilities that would go on to become features in the games themselves starting in Pokémon Crystal. This game has a lot of unique mechanics from the other Generation 1 games. Certain parts of the battle system work completely differently here compared to in Red, Blue, and Yellow, and Speaking of those games, if you're playing on the Nintendo 64 and have the transfer pack connected to your controller with Pokémon Red, Blue, or Yellow, then you can actually use Pokémon from your own team in-game. This was originally something I intended to do, however, mid-planning, I remembered that this game was recently re-released for the Nintendo Switch Online Plus Expansion Pack Nintendo 64 emulator. As a result, I'd rather play the version that I'm able to get the highest quality footage of and that most people will be able to play along with. As a result, this first episode is going to revolve mostly around the things that change when you are playing on the Nintendo 64 with the transfer pack. Not everything, as some things have a more natural spot to be talked about, but I think it'd be best to go over the things I can't show here first. With that said, you're sort of seeing what makes this game so damn charming with this little uh, demo reel, but let's get right into the game. Pokémon Stadium. Right off the bat, they have a game pack check here still, regardless of the fact that in this version of the game, there's no way to have a game pack connected. I was a bit terrified there would be a game pack connection with the recent Pokémon Presents, but luckily, my notes did not need to be completely rewritten as soon as I finished them. We're going to start off by showing off Gallery Mode. Something that I don't think many people actually know exists in this game. Take a photo of your favorite Pokémon and create some Pokémon stickers. That sounds adorable and I want to do it. Let's snap some photos. We can only do rental Pokémon here. I believe even if you have a game pack inserted, only rentals are allowed. We're gonna take pictures of Butterfree. We can pretend this is Margarine. So this is a modified version of the gameplay in Pokemon Snap. Um, <laughs> you control the, like, direction you're facing with the C buttons, and you have to move around using the, the control stick, and it just is not particularly, like, intuitive, but you can just take po pictures of Pokemon, and yeah, I'm gonna try not to take pictures too fast so I don't cause a Pokemon shock. But, yeah, it's just a, like, sort of cute way to get pictures of Pokémon you like, and we'll go over more of this mechanic in a minute once I've taken 24 pictures of this Butterfree. Out of film. There we go. Now, I can enlarge photos to get a better view of them. I actually kind of like that one. <laughs> it's not even a good picture, I just like it. Uh, let's see here. I didn't even look at it. It's just that good. It's not at all, but okay. Uh, I'll just go with that and with this one. Once you've decided on the photos you want, you can... Mm, go to gallery. <laughs> any photos that you did not mark will be deleted, so make sure to mark any photos you actually want to keep. Now... We're gonna go to pick photo, and we'll pick the actual decent one. From here, we can place them in what order, whatever order we'd want on a sticker sheet. You can see that we're like laying it out in such a way that if it were to be printed, we would have a like a good chunk of this one picture as a sticker. Uh, you have to have four photos to print your sticker sheet, and then you can press the print button at a Pokemon Snap, snap Station. <laughs> These were stations that were primarily owned by Blockbuster Video, and were used to print stickers of pictures of Pokemon taken in Pokemon Snap and Pokemon Stadium. These are occasionally sold secondhand for ridiculous prices. Uh... With even just replacement keys for them running you about $60, but 
they're almost worth it just because they're a neat collector's item. That's all there is to talk about regarding gallery mode, though, so let's head back to the menu. We'll save. This sticker sheet is very good. Next up, Event Battle. This is a battle arena for the trainer parties in the game pack set in Controller 1 and Controller 2. We don't have game packs, so the credit for the footage I'm using will be on screen because I haven't actually decided what footage I'm going to use yet, but yeah, it it is what it says it is. Uh, it basically allows you to battle using the in-game parties in Controller 1 and 2 to battle on the big screen using Pokemon Stadium's mechanics instead of the original games. It's nice of them to put it in a spot where it's easily accessible, I guess. There is also, however, Battle Now mode. This is a battle arena for people who want to try a battle now! Let's try a battle now! A one player. You can't get too crazy here. There's two preset teams. We got the default one. The... the basic-ass Pokemon team. Looking at this team... Uh, okay, so you can hold down the R button and then press whatever button will assign a Pokemon to actually check their moveset. I think this Squirtle will be pretty good here, just because of it has Ice Beam and Surf that'll take out Oddish and Vulpix and Cubone. Uh, otherwise... Uh... What has Bulbasaur got? Razor Leaf is really good. And it resists Magnemite, so let's go with Bulbasaur. And then for the rest of it, tell me Clefairy has Metronome. Okay, Clefairy has Metronome, so by default. Let's get started! This battle is for you who wanted to get into a battle right away! Say hello to the Pokemon Stadium announcer. He is the best part of this game. Listen to this. Now. Here it comes! Thunder! Oh, the attack this! Vigorous attack! Severe hit! He didn't say what I wanted him to say. Sometimes when you use Surf, he'll say, RIDE THAT SURF! And it's really... It's really exciting. He just puts a lot of energy into all his line reads in this game, which he does not do in Pokemon Stadium 2. It's just really enjoyable. RIDE THAT SURF! RIDE THAT SURF! I love it so much. He's awesome. He... Like, just listen to that. Yeah. No no wonder everyone has such fond memories of this game, even when, like, 90% of it is just Pokemon battles. This announcer refuses to let you have an, like, experience that is not memorable. I'm not really going into the controls or anything of the battles here, I just kind of want this to serve as, as an example of what the battles kind of look like in Pokemon Stadium, as well as just an introduction of the announcer. It's... It's very nice that they just put this in the menu in a very convenient spot for the structure of my Let's Play. <laughs> oh, of course it has Ice Beam. I should have expected that. Why would they give the Squirtle on one team Ice Beam but not the Psyduck on the other team? Whatever, though. I'm also not going to go into the changes and the mechanics too much here. Uh, mechanics are very different between Stadium and Red, Blue, and Yellow, but... The second episode in this part of the Let's Play is basically completely 100% just going into, like, the actual details of all the differences in the battle system. Just know Razor Leaf is pretty much equally as likely to be a critical hit, but it's a different equation to determine that it's pretty much equally as likely. It's nice, I can, like, kind of stop commentating occasionally in this game, too, because the announcer will just fill in any, spe like, blank space for me. It sure is Clefairy. Clefairy's here to do the best thing ever, which is Metronome. <laughs> it's not, it's not Gaster, so we can't guarantee that it's gonna do anything useful, but, hey. 
Metronome has rarely let me down in the past. Karate chop. Tactical. Tactical critical hit. You see? There, there is a science to using metronome, and we are going to get taken out by Thunderbolt this turn because uh, there's no 1 and 256 glitch. There is a glitch that replaces it, but again, we'll talk about that in the next episode. Still, good tactical crit. It's pretty much down to if Squirtle's faster or not now. There's nothing left in reserve. There's just one Pokemon aside now. True. The battle is coming right down to the wire. True. Yeah, okay, we lost. That's fine. It was worth it. It was worth it to get the funny Metronome Karate Shop critical hit. It was tactical. Clefairy just wasn't able to do it on her own. A real tragedy, honestly. I think that served as a pretty good example of how much style this game has, and that's sort of where I want to leave these menu options here. All the, I mean, obviously we can go to the actual options menu where you can see, for some goddamn reason, they actually give you the reason to disable the announcer, but do not do that ever, monster. With that, we are going to head into the stadium mode proper. Find the stadium, battle sites, Pokemon Lab, and minigames here. So, there is a lot going on here, but we're actually only really going to focus on one thing here. Uh, there's really not much we're restricted from, but to start, we're going to go to Professor Oak's lab. His research lab. He can help you check your Pokedex, organize items, and trade Pokemon. A Pokemon game pack is not inserted. Turn the N64 control deck off! Then insert the game pack. So yeah, once again, uh, we're kind of out of luck. I'm going to try to get footage of this using an emulator, but we'll see. Otherwise, if I can't really get any because emulation of this game is notoriously not particularly easy. Yeah, we're... Look, I'm doing my best here, okay? <laughs> In order to access most of the features, every game pack in the Nintendo 64's controllers has to be saved in a Pokemon Center after obtaining the Pokedex. The only exception here is the Pokedex, which can be viewed regardless of where you saved as long as you're not playing the Japanese version. The Pokedex allows you to view almost all the information about Pokemon you could see in the Game Boy games, though with some new Pokedex entries. There's also a 3D distribution map that shows the location and levels of wild Pokemon in the connected games. This includes listing different sections of the same place, like different floors and caves or different areas in the Safari Zone. There is one exception. Cerulean Cave, or the Unknown Dungeon, as it used to be known by some sources, is not listed here. Any Pokémon that appear exclusively in Cerulean Cave, such as Rhydon or Hypno, will simply have their map area say Area Unknown. Regardless though, this map is shockingly thorough. Next, the PC. The PC can be used to move items and Pokémon, as well as view a list of every Pokémon in your party or PC boxes. This also provides 100 item slots per player on the Pokémon Stadium cartridge itself, allowing you to, for example, trade a fresh water from one save file to one earlier in the game. This allows you to enter Saf Saffron City extremely early and gives you much greater access to the Kanto region earlier in the games. It's a fun way to play. The Trade Machine allows you to trade Pokémon between cartridges inserted into your controllers. Using the Trade Machine, you can trade from your party or your PC boxes, making it much less annoying to use than the Cable Club in the Game Boy games themselves. This can't be used to trade with Pokémon Gold and Silver, however, until Pokémon Stadium 2. There is one more feature here, but it won't be unlocked until later, so... On to the next thing. The Bizarre Game Boy Tower. This is an emulator. It allows you to play any Generation 1 game with its Super Game Boy colors. However, if you complete the Poke Cup and Prime Cup, which we'll talk about later, 
You unlock the Doduo Game Boy Tower, which allows games to be played at twice the speed, and if you complete every cup, you unlock the Dodrio Game Boy Tower, which allows you to play at three times the speed. Four times the speed in Stadium 2. I've taken advantage of the speed boost throughout the LP. It's very useful for Generation 1. With each upgrade, you also unlock new borders that you can switch between by pressing the Z button while playing. Interestingly, the Game Boy Tower uses a modified version of the Super Game Boy 2's BIOS, meaning that if it's forced to run a Game Boy or Game Boy Color game other than the ones in the Pokémon series, it will run it identically to said peripheral, complete with the special borders, colors, and sounds programmed onto the cartridges. The save feature won't be functional in this scenario, though, due to the tower not being programmed to recognize any non-Pokémon ROMs. One last thing. The most major difference that not using the transfer pack introduces is that you cannot use Pokémon from the Game Boy games in the various game modes. We'll show this off in the free battle mode. If you have a transfer pack inserted with a game that has the Pokedex, then you can choose from those Pokémon. However, in the case of us being stuck without the ability to use the transfer pack, we can only use rental Pokémon. These are... weird, to say the least, but we'll go over them another time. For now, though, it's time to say goodbye to Hiket and the rest of the team for a while. They aren't going to be able to help us through Pokemon Stadium, unfortunately. With all that talked about, that's everything that requires the transfer pack for now that I wanted to talk about. There's more, obviously, but we'll go over that later. Next time, we'll go into what exactly is so different about the mechanics in this game's battle system. I know this seems like a lot of technical stuff before we even really start the game, but trust me, this is kind of necessary. <laughs> See you guys then.